So tonight's topic is a pretty heavy one, okay? It's talking about pain and suffering, uh, death, the meaning of life, these ultimate issues that we all have to deal with. These are some of the topics that we talk about in Rosho Christi, as Rebecca had mentioned, and that is uh, a, Rosho Christi stands for the reason of Christ. It's a Latin phrase for the reason of Christ. And what we do is we give reasons for the hope that we have in Christ. It's what we're commanded to do in 1 Peter 3.15. Is always be ready to, to give reasons for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Now, if you're interested in the topics that we might cover in Rosho Christi, you can always text this little symbol, at 16RC, that's the message, including the sign, to 81010, and it's the remind.com service. Maybe you've had this in high school or maybe even college, where your teacher has a remind service, and when they have an announcement to the class, then they send that out. I do this on a weekly basis for Rosho Christi. I'll make a long email that has the content of that week's discussion, and then I will send out a text link. So if your inbox is just jammed like most people's, uh, you can get the text link, and you can click that link, and it'll take you to a browser version of this email, and it has the content of our discussion. So I know people are busy, you can't always make our discussion easy. But if you at least sign up for our Remind service, then you'll get the topics that we cover uh, each week. I wanted to tell about my, my brother-in-law, Ken Brown. As you can see, he has both dates by his name. He passed away in November, at the 23rd, just before Thanksgiving. He was diagnosed with glioblastoma multiforme. It's an aggressive brain cancer in May of last year. Uh, so it was a really difficult time, uh, 191 days. He and my sister were married in 1997. And, uh, and so um, dealing with his loss and his illness as a brother, kind of closer than a friend, but more distant than a spouse. So it was a, it was a unique position to be in, to kind of walk with Patty through through that road, walk with Ken through that road, and it causes you to read the Bible differently, it causes you to pray differently, it causes you to really think through life, and, and perhaps you have trials in your life too that you have to really chew on. So tonight, I'm not going to really present a lot of answers, because pat answers really don't go that far when you're talking about suffering. But I am going to tell you some of the things that I saw in the Bible that gave me hope. Okay? And so this is a, a message of hope tonight. But we also will cover some apologetic uh, portions of the talk. Notice a lot of people will talk about the dash. And if you've never heard about the dash, you go to a tombstone, you see the two dates, but you see that dash in the middle, and your life is represented by that dash, they say. And so this dash of life, where you have to squeeze in everything important before the end date, it's sort of this... This uh, almost a pessimistic view of life, if you will. It seems optimistic at first, but if you get diagnosed with a terminal illness, then that dash seems to be getting cut short. And so it's not as optimistic, optimistic as it sounds. Tonight we're going to talk about the thing that happens after that end day. And so it, the dash isn't everything. And that's the hope that we have in Christ. That that dash is not ending on the end day, that it continues on to eternity. Now, this is a classic problem in Christianity. It's called the problem of pain. And the thing about the problem of pain is that there's an emotional problem of pain, and there's a logical problem of pain. And if someone's coming at you with the problem of pain, maybe they're, they're struggling with their faith because they've been hurt, they're in a difficult situation, they maybe have a terminal illness, or this is an illness that may not be terminal, but this may be really tough, cancer or something of that sort. Um, what do you do? Well, if you hit them with the logical argument, and they need the emotional support, you've missed the boat, right? But if someone comes at you with a logical argument, and you hit them with the emotional support, you've also missed the boat. So you have to start this thing with questions. So let's go through the logical argument really quickly, and then we'll deal with the emotional side too. So this would be sort of the, the logical problem of pain, that an all-good God would prevent pain, and that an all-powerful God could prevent pain. And so the skeptic says pain proves God is either not good or not powerful or non-existent. And so this has been a traditional challenge to the Christian faith for years. 
that they come out and say, you say God is good, right? You say God is powerful. Well, why does he stand there with his arms folded while we suffer? And it's a, it's a valid question, but it's an emotional question. The, the logical answer to that is much deeper than just saying, you know, God's standing there folding his arms. He's not folding his arms. And so when someone comes into you, you need to say, whoa, wait a second. <laughs> not so fast. It's not that cut and dry to say, God's just standing there with his arms folded watching us suffer. Okay? What do we know about God and his response to the brokenness of this world? This, this is a Christian organization. You guys have some of the answers, right? What's the Sunday school answer for this? Jesus, Jesus exactly. The, the Sunday school answer is Jesus, right? Well, what, is, what about Jesus? Did God identify with your suffering? Mm -hmm. Yes. You ever heard of 39 lashes? 40 lashes was a death penalty. 39 was one lash short of a death penalty. Jesus suffered that on our behalf. Crucifixion wasn't just killing someone. It was torture and death combined. Um, Jesus being the God-man, God experienced that pain. He experienced the torture. He experienced the evil of what mankind can do on other humans. But even beyond that, what could we say to someone who comes at us with a skeptical, logical argument, which is the problem of pain? We might acknowledge that we have a limited perspective. Think about the shock that a baby feels when it goes into the, to the doctor's office and you've got happy nurses and doctors and practitioners there and their cartoony scrubs. Right, and they come in and they check the weight and they check the temperature and they, you know, pat the baby and are nice to the baby and then they come in with three needles because it's the wellness check and it's time to get the vaccination. You know, and mom's soothing the baby and then bam, bam, two nurses hit it in the thigh with two needles and then another third, bam, you get three shots in one and this baby's never really felt pain consciously until that point. Wow. Okay, what? torturous event. Is there any way that baby understands what's going on? That is the limited perspective that we have on our pain. We have no idea what's going on. And could it be that God has morally sufficient reasons for our pain? It's, it's again, this is the logical side of things. That's not much emotional support to just say, well, God has reasons, right? That's not what you say to someone who needs a hug. Okay? But we're on the logical side of things right now. We're talking about how can a good God and a powerful God allow suffering. We are left with our limited perspective to think through those things. Let's look to see what the Bible says, and maybe it has some information to inform us on what God is doing with our lives. Okay? Here's a, here's a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And it says, We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal bodies. This term manifested is kind of a, an older term, or you, know, you may not understand really what a manifest is, but if you look up a manifest, it's a, it's a bill of sale, it's a bill of goods. A truck shows up to the loading dock, and he's got a manifest. And it lists everything that he's delivering. Okay? And so what is this talking about? It says that the uh, Jesus is manifest in our body. That's on the list. Our bodies have Jesus. Okay? It's a part of us. And it gets us through this suffering, this crushing, and this uh, driven, per driven, perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. They asked Jesus about this. His disciples, they saw a blind man who had been blind from birth, and they said, uh, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You know, that's sort of our tendency to say something must have happened. You read Job, his friends came and said, 
You know, no one suffers this bad without a reason. Okay, he must have done something to upset God, or he wouldn't have allowed this much suffering. And they were asking the same thing of Jesus. And he answered, it wasn't this man that sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. And then he healed him. So there was a purpose that was hidden up to that point. And then once he was healed, this person was a great witness for Christ. Okay? Even talking to the Jewish leaders. In Romans, this is one of the more difficult verses to read when you're suffering. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, this is the tough part. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That's not good advice. Tell somebody who's suffering, rejoice. <laughs> right? Again, this is on the logical side of things. We're analyzing pain and suffering through God's eyes in the Bible. So what is being produced in us through suffering? It's endurance. But what if we don't laugh? What if, like Ken, our life comes to an end? It comes to an end on, on the earthly side. But we're eternal beings. Okay. Who's to say that our endurance isn't an eternal endurance? Who's to say that our understanding of what Christ did for us on the cross isn't an eternal understanding? Who's to say that when we see him suffer, we really don't connect with it until we've suffered some of we have an appreciation that goes on for eternity because we've suffered too. We've received a tiny taste of that. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know more fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. Here we are again, faith in Christ, that's how we receive that grace. Hope, which comes from endurance and perseverance, that is producing character and is producing hope in us. And then it ends up in love. But the greatest of these is love, Paul says. We have a similar story told in James. So you see, this isn't just Paul. This isn't just Peter. This isn't just Jesus. It's James. It's, it's all throughout God's Word that, that there's something in suffering that we need to pay attention to. So James says another tough one. Count it joy, my brothers. Joy? <laughs> when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete. Again, God is working a, a work in us to make us perfect and complete and enjoy his presence forever. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it, what is it? It is wisdom. It will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And I know you may have experienced that. I may have experienced that. We see people like that, too, that are just tossed by the wind. When life is hitting them hard, and they're just, they're just being tossed by the wind. That's when we reach out to them. That's when we help them have hope. So clearly, God's Word expresses an eternal perspective, not just a perspective focused on this earth. If you read Ecclesiastes, it's one of the most depressing books. <laughs> okay, It's like life is meaningless under the sun. All is futile under the sun. It's a chasing of wind under the sun. But what does he mean when he says under the sun? He means on this side of our end day. On this side of our end day, all will be forgotten. Go to the graveyard and look at all of those tombstones. How many of those people are really remembered? It may be, though, that God is more interested in our character over comfort. 
And so is he trying to develop something in us that drives us deeper into his word, that drives our faith stronger into his sustenance, that lifts our spirits too when we need it? He is answered in so many ways. He's answered in, in not only the ways of art and music, the ways of Christian fellowship, he's also answered in the ways of medicine and training of doctors and nurses and people that are driven into those fields to serve their fellow man. The most caring nurses and doctors, the most uh, strident research that's being done, all of those things are enabled by God, giving us our minds and our hearts and our motivation to serve others. So Paul says, again, as, a, as evidence that God's more interested in our, in our character than our comfort. I mean, how many of you kind of, just by being in, the, I guess, the happy Christian circle, maybe even the Christian bubble, some would say, feel like everything's going to work out as a Christian, right? Life's going to be sweeter than it would be if you're not a Christian, okay? It's just going to be happy times. I mean, we kind of get this story. And it's not true. Uh, look at Paul. Okay, this is this little brief thing that Paul's talking about. He's talking about the he was sort of arguing and telling the Corinthians. You know, these people are bragging about how strong Christians they are, and he says, "You're forcing me to brag as well." And he said, "I don't want to do this." But he finally says, "You know, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one." And he even says, "I'm talking like a madman." Right? <laughs> He's like, "But let me go down the list." Uh, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 minus one. Five times. If you've not seen The Passion of the Christ, you need to watch it. Just for that scene alone, to see what 39 lashes would have took with the cat of nine tails is like. And Paul received that five times. Three times I was beaten with rods, once with a stone, three times shipwrecked, a night and a day adrift at sea. Frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the woods, hardships, toil, uh, sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, without food. This, you know, can you imagine a recruiting poster with this on the front? You know, be a Christian, travel the world, see great sights, get beaten, get, you know, down to the front friend, you know, uh, beaten with rods and, and shipwrecked and so on. Um, of course, yeah, hindsight's great, right? You look back and you say, yeah, but Paul came through all of that. Tell him that when he's being stoned. You know? No, those stones really hurt. Beat with rods, getting whipped. Okay? A drifted sea for a whole day. I mean, that's... In the midst of that pain and suffering, your perspective gets narrowed down. And you need, you need the hope that only Christ can give. In Hebrews, a lot of times we talk about it, we call it the, the roll call of faith. And we go through Abraham's faith and Noah's faith and so on. And it's sort of a nice thing about the roll call of faith. All of these people had faith. But it says at the end of that chapter, they all died not having received the things that were promised. How many of you people have been told, find a promise in the Bible? I mean, this is the promises of God in the Bible. And it's almost like you're going to hold into the contract, right? This is a promise. I'm going to claim that promise and hold as if you're going to hold God's feet to the fire to deliver on his promises. God will deliver on his promises, but it may not be on this side of your end date. In Hebrews it says, they all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth, were citizens of a different kingdom. So these are the logical things, the logical side of suffering. Let's go to the emotional side now. Um, we, if you're, if you're truly a follower of Christ, I mean, you want to follow Christ, you'd probably ask this question. Jesus, please use my life. Would you use my life to help others? Would you use my life to, to witness to your goodness, to your mercy, to your love? Uh, but, but what if it's not just your life that Jesus wants to use? What if it's also your death? What if your suffering is going to cause someone else to light up as a witness for Christ? So 
So how many of y'all have heard of a double bounce? Mm -hmm. Trampoline, you ever heard of a double bounce? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'll go through it and we'll watch the video. Okay, so this is the double bounce. So regular jumping on the trampoline, okay? You can only put so much uh, potential energy into that trampoline, right? It's your mass and gravity, that's about it. F equals your mass, okay? So you can only get so high on the trampoline. But if you add another mass, okay, it adds tension to that trampoline. It pushes it down a little farther. And then you come down, you go down further than you've ever been. It's a deeper descent than you've ever been, okay? And then that person hops off, okay? And so this mass is removed, and now you're under much more pressure. You're lower than you've ever been, and the pressure's greater than it's ever been. And you might start to worry, okay? But after that pressure is relieved, you go higher than you ever were going before. And so this is what came to me as I was thinking about the difficulty of Ken's death, and as we were going through that, and, and just praying for, you know, what, what possible outcome could, this, could be worth this, right? I mean, what is this, what do we do with this level of, of pain and suffering? You know, Ken and Patty, they devoted their lives to, to business and accounting. He was a partner in Ernst & Young, very successful person, uh, really started their international tax advisory service, helping companies, whole companies, like big ones, like Exxon, okay? Big companies strategize where their assets were and, and doing more of their company's business and paying less taxes, sort of overhauling the whole corporate tax structure. And he developed this at Ernst & Young. And then after a very successful career, my sister had started teaching accounting at UT, and so he said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to start giving back to the next generation, and I'm going to teach at UT also. So he went, he quit his job, retired and then started teaching at UT and taught one semester, or maybe fall and spring, and then was diagnosed with cancer, so took his life. And you gotta wonder, like what happened? You know, we had this great plan to fill that dash with some fantastic you know, information and give back, and then the end date comes. And so I looked at this and I thought, wow, this is a difficult situation. But I thought, what if Ken's death tightens that spring for all of us? And then when he's gone, it springs us up. We do more. We go higher. We see further than we would ever have seen before because of what happened to him. And so that's essentially what happened. This, you know, we started a, my sister started a Kenneth C. Brown Memorial Endowed Scholarship. And all of his friends and, and colleagues at Ernst & Young gave money. They, they gave up a, a 50, last check was $50,630. And then the university matched some of that. And now it's, the endowment is $83,980. And this is an endowed scholarship. So the interest on that money will pay for an accounting student to go through UT. And his, you know, as long as the principal's not tapped, that's going to be year after year after year. He's able to give back to a student to support them in accounting at the University of Texas. But you know, many of the people that he impacted in the corporate world, they make more than 83000 in a single year, you know. And yet, they have now joined this army of encouragers. Because on his little rally hood site, they were talking about how much he was such an encourager to them in their, in their, uh, in their life, in their, in their jobs taking personal interest in them. If, if there was one thing that he did to all his colleagues was notice something special about them and allow them to reach their potential. He was like Barnabas. He was a son of encouragement. And he would light their world up and, and bring them along. And so more so than this endowed scholarship, the army of friends that Ken has are now out there to encourage others because of what I call the double bounce. He went first and tightened things up for us, sent us lower than we've ever been, and now we've gone higher than we thought we could go. If you want to set the balance, let me just show you, go back to this. This is an example of what I'm talking about, the secret the inner war force. Of course, we get a cat video. That's cute. 
<laughs> okay, see? They're double bouncing. So they're putting their weight in and sending him up. <clears throat> and he goes all the way to the ceiling. <laughs> so I grew up doing that kind of stuff in the gymnastics class. So I know me doing gymnastics, but still. So we've gone further and higher than, than we could have gone without Ken's influence on our life. But still, how do we survive the pain? Because it's not just the pain at the end of life, it's the pain of suffering, it's the pain of loss. It, there's, there's, a, there's a thousand pains, and everybody has them. Okay? But it's the same way that you survive nuclear radiation. And I worked in a nuclear <laughs> radiation plant, so I know about nuclear radiation. You survive nuclear radiation with shielding, okay? How many people recognize the shield? Yeah. See, it's a uh, high row. It's the uh, it's the um, it's the shield that uh, basically they constantly melt. So Paul is telling us, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So these emotional attacks come at you, and yet you must have your faith intact. That faith is what what will protect you from despair. When Paul says we're crushed but not destroyed, it's that shield of faith that protects us. <clears throat> this is that shield of faith when it was in King David's life. Uh, King David's son was ill, and while he was ill, he stayed on his face in the temple before the Lord. But then once the son died, he got up and washed his face and went on with his life. The servant said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. And David said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him. He will not return to me. And so he's illustrating his faith. He will go to his son. We will see Ken again. We will see my, my son, Andrew. We will see those that we've lost in Christ. Christ is our shield, not our emotional fortitude. This isn't something that you can just do on your own. So telling somebody that they can just pull themselves up with their own bootstraps, it's not going to work. That's really not supportive. It's, it's Jesus or nothing. The only power we have to help us in these situations is Christ. They might be able to get a little ways down the road with the strength of character, but you need to be there for them when they hit bottom because Christ is the only one that can pull them out of that pit. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. You give me the context for this. Who was he talking to and what was the situation? It was the one who married the flattered Exactly. It was with Lazarus. This was, and think about how difficult it was. Jesus, they said, Lazarus is sick. He's your friend. Come help him. He had healed so many people. Do you know how far away he was from Bethany? God knows. He stayed three days. Could he have helped? Five miles is, he'd walk to Westridge. Okay. He'd walk across Huntsville. It's basically from one side of Huntsville to the other. Or Elkins Lake. Okay. You're that close, and you don't come help? No wonder Mary and Martha were mad. You were just over there. Why didn't you come and help? Okay. Again, he let this happen so that the raising of Lazarus could happen. Okay? And he said, what do you believe? This was, this was, uh, this was Martha, I think. So what do, you, what do you believe about the resurrection? She goes, oh yeah, I know I'll see Lazarus in the, in the resurrection. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. If you believe in me, you will live. <clears throat> and so in Romans again, Paul says, let us cast off the work of darkness and put on the armor of light. <clears throat> Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, not in quarreling or jealousy. Now, you know, that sounds 
pretty prudish. But also, when people are upset, don't they do some crazy things? This is saying, don't go off the handle. Don't throw everything that you know to the wind and fight and scream and, and yell and, and, and quarrel or get completely drunk and try to stone yourself into oblivion. None of that's going to help. Put on the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. Another way that you put on Christ that you may not have connected is, is here in Galatians. It says, for many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So if you want to know how you put on Christ, how do you put on this shield of faith? You believe in Christ and are baptized. That is when you put this shield of faith on. You need to remind yourself of that all the time. Uh, Martin Luther says, remember your baptism every time you wash your face. You know, it's just a daily reminder that you have the armor of Christ on you. And therefore, do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely, incomparably, eternal weight of glory. This does not feel like a momentary light affliction. really does. 191 days for Ken and my sister. Um, 29 days for, for, for us with our son. Uh, there's just a lot of instances in life that don't feel momentary in life. But we don't have that eternal perspective. What does it mean to have an absolutely incomparably eternal weight of I don't think we have a good feeling for what glory is. Have you ever really thought about that word? Justifiable fame is one of the one of the phrases that I've heard that is sort of a capture of glory. What is justifiable fame? Okay. Have you ever been to the Olympics? Right? Sort of the paragon of 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 following the rules and so on. Let's not talk about the doping and all the negative stuff, but the Olympics and its best. People doing, I mean, the top of the top athletes. They run their race, they, they win the prize, they have gold medals, and what happens? They put them on that podium, they play that person's national anthem, and they stand there in glory. It's approval. It's approval of everybody that has watched that event to say, this is the best athlete today in this event. That's glory. What is an eternal glory? That is God saying, look, you have run the race. You have done the thing that I've asked you to do. And I'm saying, good job. That eternal weight of glory is God's approval. And that's what's waiting for you. And compared to that, this life and its pain and its troubles are momentary. We are experiencing the depths of this double bounce. Many of us have gone deeper than we thought we could go. But eternally, we're going to go higher than we are. It's something I don't think we can understand. And so we just need to become along the side of when we're suffering, give hugs, deal with the emotional side. Because we're in this together. But then we need to also encourage each other with the hope that we have. We need to put on the armor of God that we have. That shield of faith that protects us and provides the hope that we need. Uh, you can find out more about these kinds of messages and these thoughts uh, on my blog. As I blog through this, I've written a couple of posts related to Ken. One of them is called Double Bounce, so you can find that. It's on apologeticsforall.com. I've also written some other things on faith. I've written some things about The Fault in Our Stars. Has anybody read that book or that movie? I've got a three-part series on The Fault in Our Stars talking about how the philosophy of that book is nihilism. There is no purpose to their suffering. They just got cancer, and they died, and things were just, what? Okay. They weren't good. There was no hope in that book. There was friendship, and I liked that part of it. 
but it wasn't anywhere close to the hope that we have in the scripture. And so I've written a couple of posts on that because I saw that that was such an influential book on the middle school kids that were reading it, and so I needed to say something about it. Um, you can also walk with Beth on her blog. And so as Beth is dealing with cancer and the diagnoses and the treatments and all those things, and scripture and how she sees herself from God's word, you get a great depth of insight from her. And so this is her blog. So if you're curious about that, I would send you the, the notes. And then also, just stay tuned uh, with, with Roger Christie. Uh, we deal with these kinds of issues all the time, logical and emotional. We meet on Fridays at noon in the LSC in room 307, and it's an informal lunch. Uh, but also, if you'll text uh, 16RC to 81010, then you'll get the links in our discussions. You can also go back in time and see all of our archives. So at this point, I'll open it up for questions. Any kinds of questions? Okay. You mentioned the emotional stuff there. Yes. I think, with, I think the logical side is pretty straightforward yeah. in the Bible. There's some good suggestions for somebody who maybe needs the other side of the bit. It's so individual. For me, it's music. Um, you might have heard of Far Age Requiem. Yeah. Um, but even today, uh, as I was preparing this, just wanting to write, I didn't want to listen to something with lyrics because that would pull me off path. Eric Whitaker. Um, if, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. So uh, today, the one that really, really hit me was. Um, phone is being used on the Facebook Live, but it was the uh, Depeche Mode song that they did. Um, it's about embracing the silence, I think is what it's called. No, it's, but anyway, this one is, is basically saying uh, embrace the silence, words in, intrude. It's a, it's a purely emotional song. He, I could picture it says, all I want or ever needed is right here in my arms. I don't need your words. So that's the, so is this, if you have Amazon Prime, how many, y'all have, you have Amazon Prime? Okay, okay, good, that's about half the group. Okay, I mean, Amazon Prime's not that cheap, right? But it is worth it, I think, for the music alone. There's Amazon Music, and Eric Whitaker's album is on there. Okay, it's live at iTunes. It, it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing. So uh, try Amazon Music. You can sample all kinds of new music. And so I would say, for the emotional side of things, for me, it was music. If many people would say, oh, that's escapism. But I don't think that's bad. God gave us the arts. For a reason. Um, yeah, Jason, uh, there's a guy named Jason Gray that I listen to later he had a lot of struggles and so he yeah. a lot about that. If you want to know about suffering, Annie Johnson Flint. It's, it's probably, she writes the best poetry I've ever read on the topic of suffering. Let me go back to where I was. <coughs> Johnson Flint. Um, poetry, let's see. Here it is. Of course, most of her poems were turned into hymns. And so you may have may have heard some of these hymns, but these are these are amazing. Yes, we have the Psalms in the Bible, but the Psalms are poetry written in Hebrew. Okay? We lose the poetic nature when they've been interpreted into English. 
Okay, we might still get the word. We might still get the meaning, but we don't get the poetry. Okay, and so find hymn writers and poets that speak from your heart, and and they will really help. <coughs> um, this is one of my favorites. He giveth more grace. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he added his mercy. To multiply trials, his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed, ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit, his grace has no mercy. His power no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. <coughs> I don't get that from the Psalms. I do get hope from the Psalms, but it doesn't touch me as much as some of these poems. Now, Annie Johnson Flint, you read about her life, it was miserable. She had such bad arthritis that she just was bedridden. Day in and day out in the bed, writing these poems. So she knows about suffering, and you can tell from her poetry. So on the emotional side of that, that's um, that's what I turn to. I'll turn to poetry. I'll turn to music. Uh, I will get noise canceling headphones <laughs> <laughs> and um, and just lose myself kind of in the words of others. They kind of carry me through. And, and I think that's important. Um, reaching out to others who, I guess, know how to be quiet and just be there for me. And so that's why we're in this together. We're not alone. We are not alone. And so with that, I'll, I'll close in prayer.